Am. Good morning. There we are. Um, thank you for joining us. Boy, if you're here for the first time, we're so glad you came out. I realize it's a big step. Thanks for doing that. And if you're joining us online, thank you too for being with us. So most of us have either played baseball or softball or watched the game. We understand there's an umpire. It's really tough to do without an umpire. And the umpire, uh, both teams agree before the thing, has authority. That umpire calls balls. That person calls strikes. On a play that's close, they call them safe or out. And that's the agreement. We're, we're going to roll with the ump's call. But there are times that teams don't like it, managers don't like it, players don't like it, and they will get up in the ump's face and they will say, you are flat wrong, blah, 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 and, and the ump will take so much and then he say, you know what? You're out. You leave the stadium, you're done. You didn't recognize the umpire's authority and at some point the umpire says, yeah, no more. You're out, just leave. Well, as much as an umpire has authority in a baseball game, God has authority in our world. He has rightful authority. And what happens when we reject that authority? For the coach, or player, they get tossed from the game. How does God deal with us? That's what I want us to talk about today. So if you've got a Bible, if you'd open it to 1 Samuel 31, we're going to go through and we're going to wrestle with that question right there. How does God respond when we reject his rightful authority? Let me give you a quick overview. 1 Samuel, we're going to finish today. We'll go into 2 Samuel. Israel is making a transition from being a Loose federation of states to a theocracy. Um, and they're feeling the threat of the Philistines. And we'll talk about the Philistines today. And they think, you know what we need? We need a king. If we get a king, we'll be okay. And God says, no, no, no. You don't need an earthly king. You need me. No, no, no. We want a king. And finally, God says, okay. So you can learn. I'm going I'm to I'm answer your quest. I'm going to give you a king. And the first guy's name was Saul. And when Saul was anointed by, as a king by the prophet Samuel, the word choice was very intentional. You're a ruler, you're a prince, but you're not a king. You do not have absolute authority here. Your rule operates under my autonomy. Well, we'll look at this today, but Saul didn't get the memo on that a couple times. And God said, I'm done. I'm moving on. We're going to know another king. His name is David. I don't know if Saul figured out that David was an anointed king, but he saw <laughs> David's popularity rising and he was threatened. And anywhere, scholars decide anywhere between 10 and 13 years, Saul is chasing David, trying to kill him, and David is learning to trust God, though he's failing at times, and, and this chase is coming to a head. A couple of weeks ago, in 1 Samuel 27, David said, yeah, I don't, I don't think I can trust God. I'm going to go live with the Philistines. We said, that was a bad idea. And when we left, last time we left, when we left David, he was in line at the back of the Philistine army, ready to take on the Israelis. Um, last week we jumped over to, or two weeks ago, we jumped over to Saul, and he is wigged out by what is going on, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then um, last week we saw the Philistine Lord say, you know, we don't want David here, and so David is excused. So that's where we got. We're at the battle. Let me give you just a couple things of how, a uh, couple tidbits of how things are going. First Samuel 28, 4 and 5. Getting us up to peace. So the Philistines gathered together and came and camped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they camped in Gilboa. When Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Remember, the Philistines have more soldiers and they have better weapons. And to this point, God has put a hedge of protection around certain people like David and Jonathan. And he's given them victory in battle. But, but Saul is separated from God. God has moved on, taken his spirit from him. Saul's trying to get an answer from God. God ain't answering. So Saul, who had removed spiritists from the land, seeks a spiritist and said, can you get me the spirit of Samuel? And Samuel was the prophet. He'd been the voice of God for years. He has passed away. Saul says this to me, hey, can, can you bring Samuel up? I, I need to find out what's going on here. So that's what's, what's happened. I won't give you the whole conversation, but here's the last words Samuel has for Saul. This is Samuel speaking to Saul through a medium. Moreover, talking about the battle that's about to come, we're going to look at it in verse 31, or chapter 31, the Lord will also give over Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines. Catch this. Therefore, tomorrow you, Saul, and your sons will be with me, i.e., you will be dead. And indeed, the Lord will give over the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. That's a bad day to get that kind of news. That's a bummer, big time. But that's where we stand. And we pick it up in chapter 31, verse 1. It says, Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, 
And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Remember, this is a compressed narrative. This is just giving us details. Verse 2. Then the uh, Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abedanab, and Malchi, Shua, the sons of Saul. So there's part of the prophecy. Three sons are dead. Verse 3. The battle went heavily against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, kind of his lieutenant, draw your sword and pierce me through with it. Otherwise, these uncircumcised will come and pierce me through and make sport of me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. So Saul took his sword and fell on it. Remember, David two times had Saul dead to rise and said, I can't raise my hand against God's anointing. I think the armor bearer is feeling the same thing. I, I can't kill the king. So Saul knows what's going to happen, so he falls on his sword. Verse 5, when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. Thus, Saul died with his three sons, the armor bearer, and all the men on that day together. Just like Samuel said, you're going to be with me. Well, how's this play out with the other soldiers, Jewish soldiers? Verse 7, when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley with those who were beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned the cities and fled. Then the Philistines came and lived in them. So remember this king that was supposed to, you know, deliver them. And we're going to trust in the king. That ain't working out too well. The Philistines are now occupying Israeli territory. So how do the Philistine soldiers respond to this? Verse 8. It came about the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain. That they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head, a barbaric act, and stripped off his weapons and sent them throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his weapons in the temple of Ashtaroth. You remember when they captured the ark, they did the same thing. This is the sense that our God conquered their God. And they fastened his body, his headless body, to the wall of Beth Shan. And they're making a statement. Here's our trophy. And we'll find out not only did they fasten Saul's body, but his three sons. Heads cut off. On the wall. Won't even give him a decent burial. We won't take time to look back at it. But back in 1 Samuel 11. Probably Saul's greatest act as king. Some men from Jabesh. Or the city of Jabesh Gilead. Was under siege. And the person that was. Threatening him said. I'm going to gouge out. The right eye of every man. And they called for help. And Saul rallied Israel. And they defeated him. And, and liberated these people. Well these people are grateful to Saul. So here's what they do. Now, when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men rose and walked all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there. They took their bones and buried them under the Tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. They give him a decent burial. How did, how did we get here? What went wrong that God's king is fastened with his head cut off on a wall along with his three sons? This wasn't God's desire. This wasn't God's plan. But Israel was facing a superior army, superior numbers, superior weapons. And if they were going to have any success at all, it was going to be the hand of God, the hedge of protection and Saul walked away from that. How? Well, let's talk. 1 Samuel 10, verses 1. This is when Saul was anointed as king. The wording's pretty intentional here. So then Samuel took the flask of oil and poured it on his, being Saul's head, kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you, and this word is important, a ruler, not a king, a ruler over his inheritance? So Saul, this is my, this is my inheritance. I'm going to have you ruling over it. But you're not a king. You don't have absolute authority here. You follow my word. Mm, Saul didn't get that memo. Two instances. First uh, Samuel 13. Samuel told Saul, you go up and you wait for me to offer the sacrifice. Well, the Philistine troops were coming and the, the Jewish troops were slipping away out of fear and, 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 and Samuel hadn't showed up. So Saul thought, man, I don't want people slipping away. So I'm going to offer the sacrifice, the religious act, to make people think, hey, God's really in this. 
Now, what Saul should have done is what David did last week when he was in crisis. People were about to stone him. It says, David found strength in the Lord. Go to God with this. But Saul was either unable or unwilling to do that. So he thought, I'm going to take this into my own hands and do my own thing. I'm going to offer the sacrifice. And he's just done that, offered the sacrifice. And guess what? Samuel shows up, and here's what he says. Samuel said to Saul, you've acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Saul, if you just would have taken me at my word, I would have established you forever. He goes on. But now your kingdom shall not endure. We're seeing the fulfillment of that. Why? The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. The heart in the Bible is the place from which we live life. That's our values. That's our decisions. That's our passions. It's what we care about. God said, I'm looking for a person. I'm looking for people whose heart is connected with my heart. They're living out the values. They're living out the priorities that I have. I'm looking for somebody who will do that. Sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And we, we found out that's David. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. That's all you missed it. You didn't have autonomy. You were supposed to be following me. You didn't follow through. One more instance, 1 Samuel 15, God gives Saul instructions to wipe out the Amalekites. We've seen the Amalekites are brutal, a vicious people. They attack, they burn, they sell people into slavery, they go after the weak. So Saul did, and God gave him victory, but he didn't take out all the people. He kept the king. Why? Because the king was a trophy, kind of like they did with Saul. It, it was, look, look who I've got subjugated to me. And he didn't get rid of the livestock, because the livestock was worth a lot of money, and a lot of food. Samuel shows up, and, and Saul says, I've kept the commandments. And Samuel says, really? What's that? What's that I hear? I think I hear the bleeding of sheep. And Saul says, oh, no, 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 no. That was the people, and we were doing it for a sacrifice. We were saving that for a sacrifice. That's our context when Samuel says this. Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Behold... To obey is better than sacrifice. God doesn't need our sacrifice. He's not up there hungry. He's not up there thinking, how am I going to fund this? He does. But what he wants is our heart. And our obedience is the show of our heart. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. I don't need what comes from the sacrifice. I need your obedience. I need to know I have your heart. He goes on to say, for rebellion, catch this, is as the sin of divination. So when you and I say to God, yeah, I, don't, I don't think so. Oh, it's just a little thing. No, it's not. It's symptomatic of we're serving some other God. Divination is when you go find some other God. So God, I don't listen to you because I'm serving the God of popularity. I'm serving the God of self. I'm serving the God of comfort. I'm serving the God of whatever, pleasure, whatever it is. Our disobedience, Saul's disobedience, is the sin of divination. And insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because, Saul, you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. That's how we got here. Saul missed the memo. I'm in charge of Israel. You are serving under my authority. Don't miss the application. You're not in charge of your life. I'm not in charge of mine. God is. And when we step out from that, we step out from under his protection, from under his favor. So we're asking this question, how does God respond when we reject his rightful authority? Here's what I'd say. Eventually, God allows those who reject his rightful authority to suffer the consequences of their rebellion. God is patient. He is gracious, he is kind, but at some point, if you and I are going to continue in rebellion, now nah, I'm doing my own thing, we will suffer the consequences of our rebellion. They think, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, okay, I, I get Saul, but now Israel's occupied. Why do the people have to suffer? Remember, because they, they used to have a land that was theirs, and now, now it's occupied. Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, they had asked for king, and Samuel said, no, that, that's a bad idea. The king's going to take, and he's going to take, and he's going to take, and he's going to take. I, I suggest you follow me rather than a king. No, 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 we want a king. Here's the upshot. Here's how this ends, First Samuel 8, verse 19. 
Nevertheless, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, which is the voice of God. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. I don't care what you say. We want a king. Even though king's going to take over, we want a king. Why? That we may also be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So the king went out before them and fought this battle. How'd that work out for them? They're occupied. Didn't work out very well. Now, after Samuel heard, had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. Do you know people or are you one of those people that has to learn things the hard way? This is Israel. Uh, you know, you have kings about it. No, kings about it. No, no, we want to keep no. Okay, okay, okay. You can learn your lesson the hard way. You don't ultimately need an earthly king. You need me. And the application for us is, we don't ultimately need a job. We don't ultimately need a spouse. A friend. What we ultimately need is Jesus. So let me take us back to the beginning of 1 Samuel. It begins with a woman who's dealing with infertility. Her name is Hannah. And she's being taunted by another wife. And she cries out to the Lord, if you will give me a child, I will dedicate him to you. And the Lord does. She gives him Samuel. And, Samuel, and she follows through. She takes Samuel to the temple. And Tamil, Samuel is the voice of God from the time he's a lad until he's in his old age. Samuel's recently passed away. But before Samuel, there wasn't much from God. He's been the voice of God. Well, when she gets her son, Hannah prays a prayer of thanksgiving. And I want to pick up the last verse of that. 1 Samuel 2, verse 10. She says this. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. And we rightfully talk a lot about the grace and mercy and loving kindness of God. And we ought to. Because it is. It's on full display in Jesus. But he's God. And if we contend with him, if we keep fighting him, we will be shattered. Now, God's not telling us to scare us or to threaten us. He's hoping we don't have to go the way of Saul. It's not a great way to go. So when I was in high school and actually in my first year of college, I was a lifeguard. And we had a six-lane, 50-meter pool. And then we had a diving well here. And then there was a, a shallow end here. And then except for that was a kiddie pool. And over here was the pump room. And the pump room is what kept that going and filtered the water and so on and so forth. And once a week, we needed to backwash the pumps. We needed to send the water the other way so it would clean out the filters and all that kind of stuff. So the guy went back to train me. Backwash. He said, Andy, the first thing you need to know about backwashing is you need to open this valve right here because the water's going. We're going to send it another way, and it needs a way to get out. And if you don't open this valve, and he showed me, the, the system starts shaking, and the pressure gauge goes up, and I thought, got it, got it. When I backwash... And then my senior year in high school, I, I was charged of pool maintenance, so every week I backwashed. The first thing I did was I went and I opened that valve. And, you know, I was never tempted to think, huh, I wonder what, how much pressure this system can hold. I wonder how much it can shake. I, I just never, you know, I'd seen that one time. And I thought, yeah, I just don't want to go there. I'm going to open that valve first thing, and, and, and we're good. That's what God's telling us. Man, don't, don't push. Don't presume on his loving kindness and mercy. Don't contend with him. You don't want to be there when the pump goes boom. Instead, let's talk about what Hannah had to say about God's king. Can we go back to him? Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And catch this. He will give strength to his king. And ultimately, in an earthly sense, we see David as the fulfillment of that. His heart was given to God. But we found out he's a flawed man. And he failed. And he will exalt the horn of his anointing. And David's failure points us to the greatest king. His name is Jesus. He hadn't failed yet. <laughs> he followed God fully. And if this book of 1 Samuel is teaching us anything, is we put our ultimate trust in Jesus. Not our spouse, not our friend, not our roommate, not our kids, not our parents, not our, not our, not our. Jesus. Here's what Paul, now Paul was persecuting Christians. He, God met him on the road to Damascus. And, and here's what Paul wrote about Jesus in Philippians 2. 
Being found in appearance as a man, Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's who we're looking to. And you know, Jesus lived on earth like you and me. And he was tempted to disobey. At the point of his greatest trial, his crucifixion, the mob came to arrest him. And Jesus said, who are you looking for? And the guy said, well, I'm looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus just answered, I am. And you know what happened when he answered, I am? Knocked everybody down. Jesus could have walked right there. But he didn't. Ultimately, he was obedient to the Father because the plan was for him to die on the cross and rise again three days later. That's the Jesus we need to reach out to. Because you and I are not that different than Saul. We're tempted to call our own shots, to do our own thing. Jesus, would you be <laughs> the God of my heart? And would you do a work in me so that I would quit living in rebellion? So I wouldn't have to suffer the consequences like Saul did. Let's call out to this Jesus that he might deliver us from the fate of Saul. So a few weeks ago, our pastor and discipleship, our pastor of discipleship and outreach preached, Jared Harms, and he had a story about his back. Well, I've got a story about my back, but it's nowhere near as exciting as Jared's. It's kind of boring. And that's really not that surprising because in every area of my life, when I compare myself with Jared, I'm kind of boring because he is the most scintillating person on our team. Right, Nate? Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's, I feel dull being compared to Jared. But with that preface, let me tell you my boring back story. So it's about 12 years ago, and I've got an office way back in the corner right there. And, and when I would go from sitting to standing, I would go, oh, man. And I would walk kind of stilted. My wife calls it my little man work, my little old man walk. I'd, and, I, and I would walk down the hall. And eventually I would walk it out. But each day it kept getting harder and harder. And I was having to go farther and farther down this hallway until one day I couldn't. And I called Hope, I said, home and I said, Hope, it's bad. I'm, we're living in South Lincoln. I'm going to drive home. You think you can make it? I think so. You think you can get out of the car? I hope so. So I did. And we laid me down. We got some ibuprofen. The next day I went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, uh, this is a, I don't think it's structural or skeletal. So I don't think you're looking at surgery. I don't think it's nerve because you're no tingling. I think it's muscular, which if you have to have back pain, that's the way to go. So we're going to send you to a physical therapist. So off I go to the physical therapist, and he walk this, do this, and he says two things, two things. One, your abdominals are weak, and your back's compensating, so we need to strengthen those, so here's some exercises we'll do. And two, you've got tightness, particularly on your right side, here's some stretches, we'll do those. That was 12 years ago. I met with that guy three times, and he said, you know what, if you'll do the exercises, you're good. Okay. Do you know I'm still following the voice of that PT? So two years ago, I started doing these classes, and we run, and we lift, and we jump, and we lunge, and we squat. It's usually about 50 minutes, and typically, not always, the last thing we do is abs, and after 45 minutes of that, I'm really tired, and with the abs, you put your mat down, and you start the exercise, and I think, yeah, I'm kind of tired here. Maybe I'll just lay here, <laughs> but then I think I hear the voice of the physical therapist, who I haven't seen in 12 years. You got weak abs. You need to strengthen your abs. Okay, I will do my abs. And then they'll take us through some stretching. And, and before I follow the teacher in any of the stretching, I do the stretches he has me do. Or sometimes they'll just leave. I'm, I'm staying on the ground and I'm stretching. Then if they're continuing to stretch, I'll join with them. Why am I listening to this guy that I haven't seen in 12 years? Here's two things I believe about him. One, he cares about me. And he wants to see me well. Two, he studied for three years on this. He's an expert on the muscles and the structure. And he can help me get to where, he can help me move out of my pain. All right, if that's true with a PT that I haven't talked to in 12 years, how much more with Jesus? Is he sovereign over every aspect of your life? Does he know what's going on in every corner of your heart? Yeah. Is he good? 
Yeah, he died on the cross. That we'd respond to the voice of that Jesus. That we don't have to go the way of this Saul. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we're grateful um, for the warning of your word. Um, disobedience has consequences. Rejection of your authority, it's, it's an issue, and it will cost us. But Lord Jesus came that we don't have to walk that road. We don't have to go that way. Would you, um, Jesus, empower us to live the life you lived in full submission to the Father, even though it was costly? Why? Because you trusted him. And you redeemed the horrific death of Jesus to the glory of his name for eternity. And, and by the way, purchased our salvation. Would our faith to walk with you and trust you grow? I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.